that's uh, that's actually all good that you said because uh, if we were to look just just like I shared uh, in my last video the the early 20th century books like uh, the game of jujitsu the uh, the secrets of jujitsu or you know the the stuff that Uenishi and uh, Yukio Tani were doing you can quite see that um, it's not only has been sophisticated sophisticatedly I don't know uh, developed, but also it's uh, now to, to only equate the groundwork with Brazil to me, especially as a judoka, I find it uh, absurd at least. But um, the thing with the American uh, jiu-jitsu that uh, you, you know, your own research or parallel research, um, it's uh, to me, it's what I am curious about is when things were happening in Brazil in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, uh, when, they, when they were having these epic fights and uh, the groundwork was developing because of the surge of judokas like uh, Omori, the Ono brothers, uh, Takeriano, etc. Not just Maeda. Maeda was almost like a mythical figure at, in the sense that he came, he taught a lot of self-defense mostly, not so much the groundwork, and then it came to you know, they learned judo and they they tied all these you know transition techniques to the ground into this you know great system that is brazilian jiu-jitsu which is you know basic newaza and my question to you is parallel to like 1920s 30s when the ground game was developing in brazil whether it's for the challenges by lay judo etc was there something on the northern part of the continent the usa was there some type of groundwork and particularly some noticeable fighters that maybe we did not notice them or we don't know about them yet that they were doing something quite similar? Well, first of all, when you say that the, the development of jiu-jitsu happening in Brazil, what exactly was developed? Like, can we look at a technique or like an oh, application? Oh, uh, yeah, sure, 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 sure. The, at the time, we have to realize that uh, groundwork is uh, steadily developed because first you had Kano, who was very much interested in self-defense. So the priority is still much like today. It's mainly the stand-up and then, of course, being competent on the ground. So later you had, um, of course, I'm not going to talk too much about the old, uh, the 1800s challenges between schools because at the time the rule set was just almost non-existent. So you either tap the guy out, either he forfeits verbally or he gets knocked out. And that's how he was pronounced the loser. So uh, the throw was not yet to be the, the, the winning aspect or like the upon you have now the, the pin, the strangle, the lock and the, th the throw, obviously. At the time, it was like basically taken to extremes. You have, for example, here in the this one, the Maruyama uh, the Mariama book where he t took so many uh, accounts talking about these fights that lasted you know, dozens and dozens of minutes. Uh, you know, you have 10 minutes on the ground, then they stood up and then he put him in north to south and then he flipped it on him. Then he cross choked him. Then they stood up and then he threw him with this throw. Like He names like five, six throws and he didn't win. So uh, essentially when either the throw knocks you out or you tap out or so you have this type of uh, groundwork that was important for the time because of the lack of the rules later you have the the uh, what we call kosen judo those uh, you know high level schools where they were fighting team against team still happens today you had oda a very key figure in groundwork he wanted to develop the ground game because he knew that he wanted to take people down and really much like hoist in ufc one basically just really surround them and limit their options and and win. So pulling guard was not illegal, like 1910s. We're talking 1910s. And then uh, he he his team or his students basically were the champions for six or seven years straight. And Oda he has a book from uh, what it's called Thus Judo Wins. And you you see things that are being developed, not so much technique, but stuff like sweeps. The ankle sweeps, you see it there. And then later you had Kanemitsu, his coach rival in a sense. He had a, he had a team 
and he wanted to dethrone him. So things like the knee bar, the triangle in the early 20s were starting to also being developed. And then his students, the Ono brothers, went and fought the Gracies. So was there techniques and setups and positions being developed? Yes. That's my question. But That's my were, answer. They being, were they being developed by the Gracies? No. No, 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 not at all. That's my point. So it's if you look at what Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, all of the innovation of Brazilian jiu-jitsu came around in the late 80s through the 90s. It was Tedede, it was Margarita, it was the Riberos. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a few people who basically in the, in, in the 90s started actually developing new jiu-jitsu techniques, new guards, different ways to apply the game. And the, the primary difference, I think, is the inclination to pull guard because mm -hmm. brazil didn't have a super strong wrestling culture right it, that that wasn't there, there are brazilian wrestlers but it wasn't like american wrestling culture where to be on bottom was actually associated it's like literally associated with femininity like you're not supposed to be on bottom like and what you described earlier of the sort of no rules pit, there's pins but it's submissions and there's no time limit that's basically what was happening in the pro catches catch can as they say in the newspapers but it's essentially just pro wrestling pro submission wrestling mm. uh, i have an article here of F frank gotch in 1905 and it, it it's a uh, narration of their match where frank gotch applies a toe hold there's various hammer locks applied uh i i, I can show you the whole thing but it breaks down a, a like you said dozen dozens of minutes 20 minutes sometimes in these matches where there is no points. I, I think it's like best of three pins or submissions is kind of the unofficial rule set that these pro wrestlers were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, like I mentioned earlier, there was this infatuation with the Oriental martial arts after they were victorious in the Russo-Japanese war. And I guess that's when the, uh, the Japanese empire became less isolationist around their sort of sacred martial arts techniques and sent out these jujitsu judo ambassadors around the world to kind of open up and like start to try and tra trade information for information. I would assume that's like a, a strong, smart dip diplomatic uh, strategy. So what we saw in the United States is these sort of challenges that are occurring where the Japanese were challenging America's exceptionalism in grappling, right? There was this rich culture of wrestling to, from like you know, from almost essentially the founding of the USA, there was always wrestling. Abraham Lincoln wrestled. It was like common for people to wrestle. And it wasn't the wrestling that we know of today, like high school wrestling with sort of very specific points and escapes and reversals from referee position. It was basically submission wrestling. Mm. If you get down to it and you, re you read the uh, historical recountings and reports of these matches that occurred, uh, and there's m many dozens of reports of the American wrestlers tapping out the Japanese fighters in some of these challenge matches. And then a few times where the Japanese were submitting the American wrestlers. But the the, the sort of like view of jujitsu, which is what the Americans called it, because from what I understand, jujitsu was representative, like we talked about earlier, of the attempt to maim or kill your opponent. It was It was the more violent application. It was the martial in the art whereas judo was more of the sporting aspect with more clear technique and rules and all of this um, formalization of the nomenclature to describe the different positions. Like that's different than jujitsu from what I understand. And there's a lot of corrections going on where the Americans would be like, oh, you do jujitsu? And they'd be like, yeah, sort of, but what we're really doing here is judo. Mm -hmm. But it became just the, the slang that the Americans used to describe any sort of Japanese arts because it was associated with the sort of finesse, the, the idea of the gentle way, which is, I believe that's what jujitsu means, like that actually stuck in the American culture. And so they continued to use that slang for a very long time, uh, despite Yamashita and some of these other professors that have trained with Teddy Roosevelt continually saying, no, this is more judo. Mm -hmm. But obviously the joint locks were applied and the judokas were kind of pigeonholed into these submission only bouts. Uh, and the, the case was when, when you have the wrestlers who can actually, you know, do the double legs and leg attacks, that was less common against uh, in the judo world, from what I understand. So it was a competitive it's part of the arsenal. Just now, I, it's not. Not, now it's not right. Um, but there's there's recounts of 
very competitive matches all throughout the, mm. for the for first 30 years of the 19th century with leg locks being applied and uh, but yeah if my point about american jiu-jitsu is one the word the, the phrase existed before brazilian jiu-jitsu if you look at well, like the first terms of brazilian jiu-jitsu maybe there's earlier uh, references to brazilian jiu-jitsu maybe in brazilian newspapers but i was haven't been able to find those i don't speak portuguese i love for people to kind of show some of the chrono chronology there um, but American jiu-jitsu, the phrase was being used as early as 1907 by this guy, Len Lanius, who is not like a super famous guy. He was a known wrestler of the time. There's obviously a lot of articles about him. Uh, but like many wrestlers, the, his retirement, it's like, what do you do? He, he didn't really open a school. From what I can tell, he became like an accountant or something. He, it wasn't like some, it didn't become his life's work. Uh, he was just a wrestler who was fascinated with the jujitsu aspect mm -hmm. and sought to create the American version, right? And call it jujitsu based on more of like a self-defense style of wrestling rather than the competitive sport style that they had been doing, the mm -hmm. catch wrestling bouts that had, you know, mm -hmm. sort of crude, crude rule sets. There is a book I have, I forgot who's the author. It's in one of my archives, like PDFs. It's called Wrestling versus Jiu-Jitsu. And you see one Japanese man, and I forget who. It's it, I haven't taken a look in this in a while. It's a Japanese man and an American man, clearly a wrestler and jujitsu, and, and demonstrating techniques on each other. There are uh, chapters on jujitsu and chapters on wrestling, and it's I believe also like nineteen maybe twenties maximum. And uh, you can see uh, there's a self defense portion which is mostly jujitsu, and then there's like sparring part and talking about how to beat jujitsu and how or how to beat wrestling or something like that so they're essentially working together yeah it's a synthesis and i think that's like something that the u.s has always done really well is mm -hmm. we, it's a multi multicultural society but there's this sort of dominant uh philosophy of american innovation and bringing in talent bringing in the best people from around the world to contribute to a collective synthesis of information in the u.s and i think that's like a key foundation of why the u.s has been so dominant maybe to a fault at this point right as like an imperial global imperialist country at this point but yeah the, the fact is i've been attacked for, for the last 10 years although only recently it's become more uh agitated as i open an official gym called american jiu-jitsu where the, the claim is basically that american jiu-jitsu does not exist i'm I'm purely appropriating Brazilian jiu-jitsu, although the irony is blatant there, right? Because like you would think, okay, well, Brazil appropriated it from Japan. If you're going to accuse me of appropriation, wouldn't that be appropriation? But then the counter argument to that is like, oh, well, in Brazil, we don't call it Brazilian jiu-jitsu. We just call it jiu-jitsu. And it's like, okay, so why do you care? Like, why do you care what I call it? Like, they, they basically say, oh, don't call it American jiu-jitsu, just call it jiu-jitsu. And we don't actually call it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu either, so it's no problem. But the fact is, it's still called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. If that's an American creation, the name itself, if we, if the Americans started calling it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in the 90s because of the UFC, oh. then I can claim whatever I want. I like as Americans, we call, we're calling Jiu Jitsu Brazilian, but that's clearly a misnomer to some extent because Japanese jiu-jitsu is highly prevalent with this incredible historical tradition, whereas Brazilian jiu-jitsu, really, it's only the Gracies. It's just the Gracies for 100 years, basically. There's not, there doesn't seem to be too much more than that. So why, why is there this obsession with, with me calling something I do American? Because like I told you earlier in the call, from an Olympic standpoint, from an international competition standpoint, you can't be an American representative of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It just makes no sense. Mm. You're, You're representing a different culture from another country. And like, it's, a, yeah, it's absolutely, it's absurd. We're all going to be like, it, is it going to be Jap Japanese Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in like some sort of interna international competition? It's not, it's not correct. Like from, from a vocabulary standpoint, like this is not grammatically correct to do this. It doesn't make any sense. So it's, it's just kind of, there's an irony there that I've stuck my finger in. It's like a pressure point of irony <laughs> in the jiu-jitsu culture. And I really think it's it's the only thing that keeps Brazilian jiu-jitsu as the sort of primary name is the Americans. 
right? Because the Brazilians claim they just call it jiu-jitsu in Brazil, mm -hmm. but all the Brazilians in America, they're very happy with it being called Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. However, it's literally false advertising for 90% of these American gyms. I've, I've toured all over the USA mm -hmm. doing seminars and every Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym I come into, not I shouldn't say every, 90% of them, it's 100% Americans. There's no Brazilians there. Mm -hmm. So they that's where this sort of lineage comes in. It's like, oh, well, I learned from this Brazilian guy. And this is, it's, it's essentially just taking advantage of this sort of exotic perception that it's like Brazilians created this mystical, magical art, but that's not what happened at all. Mm -hmm. The Japanese have created a, a, not just created, but it's a literally imbued into their very society for thousands mm -hmm. of years. And then it was mis, it's a misnomer only in the last two decades that has been called Brazilian. But prior to it being called Brazilian, they were calling it Gracie. They weren't they weren't bragging about it being Brazilian. Mm. It was Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Am, am, am I correct in that? Uh, I think so, yeah. But yeah, I think, yeah, because you see the, the J Gracie Jiu Jitsu logo, it's very old from, I don't know. Like, and I think, and part, personally, I have no problem with the term Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Let me tell you why. Even if we were to take the Japanese standards of things. Uh, a lot of schools, uh, they were doing this essentially same thing. Maybe some school focused more on sticks and, and knives and some grappling, while others maybe focused more on grappling. Maybe some others focused more, you know, it, it's like they all have that big arsenal. They, they all shared it. Sure, here's some secret technique here and there, but they all essentially shared that big arsenal. And some focused more on other things, which is fine. And but their lineage, their way of training, their tradition, it come, it goes to some type of family. So it's the Gracie school of jujitsu, and that's fine. But it's not yeah. a new martial art. That, that's, that's my problem. Well. And I'm totally fine with that as well. Like I think the analogy to like musical genre or any sort of subculture that permeates from an original sort of idea is valid. Like I'm not going to say like just because there's multiple different types of musical genres. But if music was supposedly invented in some country, they don't get to claim all subcultures and genres, right? Mm -hmm. Just like with grappling, you can't claim all of its uh, subsequent innovations that come from these different places. That's not how any sort of technology works. I think jujitsu mm -hmm. is a technology. It's, it's systematized in a similar way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's absolutely silly to say that me as an American who's come up with completely novel techniques, my techniques are novel. Like they, Worm from, guard. I have the encyclopedia, by the way. Yeah, and that that's just one. That's my most known technique. But I've been creating techniques since I was a child. Like this is what I've always done. I yeah. I, I I look at all of the grappling arts, sambo, wrestling. There's like Celtic wrestling. We've got Mongolian uh, yeah. wrestling. We have the Sangalese wrestling. Like there, this is a pervasive thing. Yeah. Grappling at its core is a fundamental root of human learning it's it's the original play right as ch if you watch any children interact eventually they're going to grapple it's instinctual it's a genetic it's on a genetic level in our dna to grapple and even even further down foundationally play right it's play without harm it's friendly sparring it's it's a it's it was happening in ancient rome in a more formalized way with pancreation but before that it was just play. It was how humans played and interacted with each other in a physical component. It was, it, that's in a super important process of just like human bonding. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just like deeper on a, on a much deeper level. Grappling itself can be shaped and formed into these different rules and be categorized in this box. And these people did it here. I just think it's not appropriate for a, a, a sect of grapplers who have misnamed who had been misnamed by Americans calling it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And it, it just happens to be a convenient marketing tool or was a convenient marketing to, for, tool for Brazilians in America who wanted to take advantage of the Jiu Jitsu swell, but were getting sued by the Gracies. So they couldn't use the Gracie marketing term because the Gracies themselves were suing other people and each other. So the Gracie's, they were suing each other about the Gracie name for who gets to use what. And it's like this Gracie, that Gracie, like now, now there's subsections of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu because of inter-family turmoil. 
Mm. And like de de demographics are destiny. The Gracie family is massive. Like the, the, the propagation of the family was so intense with so many family members. Like that's an exponential growth of a population throughout Brazil. Like that makes a difference. And I, I believe that is part of like the pillar of Gracie Jiu Jitsu and why it was so powerful because it's a very large family as well. It had a lot of representatives. They incorporated into their familial, familial culture. And I respect that. But I think it's absolutely disingenuous to try and say that anyone who now has practiced Jiu Jitsu since the UFC is somehow still only doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That is okay, absolutely. That makes it very okay. No, that's very simple. I think anyone can understand this. Here's my question. When you say American Jiu Jitsu, you know, it, it, you're clearly trying to like the, creating this distinction. If you were to say in, I don't know, two, three, two, three sentences, what is American Jiu Jitsu? Submission wrestling. Two words for you. <laughs> I don't even need sentences. Submission. Because let, let me explain. Uh, for example, we have terms in judo, Mongolian judo and Georgian judo. Why? Because they are wrestling cultures, very strong wrestling cultures. They brought their cultural breath to judo. Some of their grips, maybe some, um, not necessarily techniques because they share so many techniques. It's grappling the human body is one. And we call it a Georgian judo or a Mongolian judo because not necessarily it's a different art because it's not, but it's someone uh, demonstrating or showing off their culture through the practice of judo. I would say it's not even culture. It's purely just national identity. National identity is incredibly important. Mm. And, to, and it just doesn't make sense for the Mongolian judokas to be called Japanese judokas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. They're not Japanese. No, no the not... expression of judo, we call it Mongolian judo. You know, the, the how he grips, it's like their book wrestling or the Georgian with the cabaret. Right, but it's, it's, it's a Mongolian, right? Doing the gripping. It's right. like, it, it, it's their synthesis of grappling. It's, they, it's their expression from their, their expression national. of judo, yes. Yes, and that's all, it's very simple. It's just that, it makes like that makes sense in any other sport you'll see a national Japanese or brazilian and you're not either so we're not we're we're a product of our culture and the, the way we view the martial art is the same for example i'll give you an example uh, in when i lived in japan and the the like a big part of 2022 i would speak that there's a way of speaking to people so the way i would speak to the cashier at the store or my teacher in the language school is the same way even when I would just go into the door of it's the same way I would go into judo practice. So it's all that continuous thing. There's no like separation. Now I'm bowing and I'm saying sensei and I'm, no, it's all the same thing. And you need to learn how to use proper uh, words and conjugation when you're speaking to certain people, it's all the same in every aspect of your life in Japan. But here, for example, you just say, uh, Salut, Roman. you know, it's a, uh, you know, high, high, uh, high Roman. Customs, and right? which is my te judo teacher. We don't say hi, since how do you say that? And then you just do the bowing. Well, you can, but you know what I mean. Yeah, these are customs and traditions. Like before multiculturalism became pervasive, nations had their own customs and traditions. Mm. And if you went to a different country, you stood out because you didn't know the customs and traditions, and you had to try and acclimate. You had to try and uh, become accustomed to their customs. That's what it means to become accustomed. So to, to sort of integrate with any culture, there has to be a greater density of that culture and then a foreigner coming into that culture to then become a custom. Now, in America, that's what I'm saying. That's the fundamental inversion is there's actually many more Americans practicing American customs in Brazilian jiu-jitsu academies. And there's like this vague sort of like, are we maintaining the Brazilian customs in these American academies? The truth is they're not. So... The only the, the, the only thing that remains is Brazilian in the title of their gym and maybe the ranking system and then obviously the aggregate of jujitsu techniques that come from competition. But unless it's like a Gracie Grace like a Gracie jujitsu gym, 
which like I said, I think Gracie Jiu Jitsu is totally valid. And I think that should stay. And I also respect the Gracies for what they've done. I think it's, they're an incredible family. They were incredibly persistent on Jiu Jitsu, which is hugely respectable to maintain it over decades and multiple generations. So that's not my issue. I don't have an issue with that at all. My issue is with it being called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu when Americans are doing it and Americans are creating new techniques. And I think John Danner is an excellent example of someone who took a very diplomatic and unaggravating approach, which is to simply start calling all of his moves by their Japanese names using Japanese terminology, not referencing, you know, Mata Liao or, you know, uh, uh, what is it, Mata Vaca or like these, these Portuguese terms, like he doesn't use those because he is acknowledging a different technical lineage that he synthesized to create his own new version. And that's a, that's a really important thing. Just because to, if there's a base of some category and then you take a separate category and you perform synthesis, it is a different thing. It is not just those two things put together. The, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? That is synthesis. So my, my synthesis of grappling is a, a, an aggregate of wrestling, of catch wrestling, of pro wrestling. I use a lot of Sambo techniques. My re, I have a reverse Umoplata that I've tapped many Brazilians with. And mm. it's that I learned it studying Sambo. It was awesome. It's a turtle attack from Sambo. I, I, I think Judo probably has, has done it. Like the housing garo, like um, the guy is turtled. You lock his arm with your legs like a triangle and then you roll forward. Similar, yeah. I, I mean, the way I do it is with one leg. I, I don't use a triangle, uh, and that's because it's derivative of a sambo attack that I I saw studying sambo video. Like, I I grew up with the internet, so I have the internet. I'm like of of the first generation. Well, I'm of the generation that saw the analog to digital switch, right? Mm. So I had access to the internet at a very young age, and I I think people underestimate how incredibly valuable that is, but also impactful to not just be learning from my, some teacher at a gym. Uh, I was learning from the internet. My primary instructor, since I started grappling, was YouTube. I, my, my first exposure to submissions and jujitsu and like trying to learn a bunch of submissions was actually Submissions 101 YouTube channel. I don't know if you ever saw their old videos. Submissions 101 was like guys who had put some mats in their garage and they were making up chokes. They had like really weird chokes, like the pentagram choke, which is like a combination of like arms and legs around someone's neck. Absolutely useless, doesn't work, but they were trying to create new things. And that's what piqued my curiosity is like, wait, that's completely novel. Mm. And people are attempting to express themselves through sort of an artistic novelty. Mm. I really like that. And so I started synthesizing different grappling arts and appreciating and understanding that it's not just Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There's many things and there's a very convenient like, like uh, gravity that pulls all of these other technical attributions from different societies and cultures and like centralizes them under this umbrella of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And that, that mm -hmm. is just fundamentally inaccurate and flawed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I don't think that should be used i think there should be a differentiation for i mean there's many reasons but the main one i think is if for for the sport to ever be accepted internationally at, there has to be international competition and you can't have international competition if we're all representing brazil okay i see what you mean uh one thing or one critique i saw people say to you is you know you're ungrateful because your teacher is brazilian so you, Which, you learn something of Brazilian uh, lineage, yeah. whatever. So that, that's, a, that's a very bold claim for people who have never grappled me or trained with me or been at the academies I've trained at. But I've had, I've had a very untraditional jujitsu experience, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I first learned jujitsu from an American who subsequently... So here's the thing. My stepfather was BJ Penn's first jujitsu instructor. His name's Tom Callos. And he had experienced jiu-jitsu in San Francisco. He had gone to the Half Gracie Academy and experienced jiu-jitsu. I never met Half Gracie. I didn't know anything about the Brazilians. I was, I was watching MMA training 
when I was four years old. I so this was like 1996. Uh, I think the first UFC was 1993. Uh, so I've been around this since the since essentially the genesis of what's being called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is the American uh, description of what they were watching the Gracies do, right? But the Gracies at the time would call it Gracie Jiu Jitsu. They weren't calling it Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So this is a name applied by Americans. Now, from there, I trained with BJ Penn for a short time. He was 17, 18 at the time. I was like six years old. Like, obviously, I wasn't really training, but I was like on the mats with these guys watching what was happening. And guess what BJ Penn was doing? He wasn't doing Gracie Jiu Jitsu. If you watch BJ Penn's world championship run in Brazil, the style of passing he was using was novel. He was using windshield wipe, wiper techniques, shin across the thigh in like a reverse shin across position where the foot comes across as a hook. Uh, he, he just had a very unique style. And anyone who watched it will know that that is not Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So it, it, yeah. So there, the critique that I, that I somehow learned from Brazilians is simply not true. Because every Brazilian gym I've ever been to has kicked me out. So I, I initially went to, uh, actually, that's not true, because I, I trained with Cassio Vernek for a short period of time. He was a, he, There was a gym that was an hour away from me. I, tr I had my own academy in, in a town called Placerville, uh, where I invited the local MMA crew, a bunch of teenager wrestlers from local high school. There was an MMA gym. There, were, there was one Brazilian guy who was a purple belt. His name was Denzel. And he was just one of our training partners who was invited, but he was not our instructor. He was just another training partner. Uh, he just reached out to me recently, actually. But so I trained with these guys, Americans, one Brazilian guy, but primarily Americans. And that was when I was still in high school. So I was a freshman in high school. I, ha I hadn't really considered pursuing this as a career until I eventually I realized, wait, I'm actually pretty good at this. I have the ability to use my own techniques and win when I go to these Brazilian gyms. So I'd go to Brazilian gyms like Cassio Wernick and I would tap their brown belts as a white belt. I was like 14, 15 years old and I wasn't using Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I promise you that. And that was not a part. I was, I was literally studying shoot fighting. I was watching uh, Shinya Aoki, Dokan Jusuf Mishima, I was watching Kid Yamamoto. I actually was watching Japanese MMA as my primary base to like understand and learn. Um, and also American wrestling because I was in my American, my wrestling program at my high school. And I would use jujitsu and grappling in wrestling, not to much effect, but I won a few matches using various jujitsu moves in wrestling. And from that point, I, I dropped out of high school and I moved back to Hawaii to train with BJ Penn again where they really weren't really taking grappling and jiu-jitsu that seriously anymore. And I, I basically just became the instructor at their academy. And they rapidly promoted me through the belts to purple belt as a 16, 17 year old. And I started teaching all the classes there until eventually I left because I needed to find more competitive training. So I tried to go to Irvine. So this is, I actually made an attempt to go to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu place. Cause I was like, I want to learn this style. I want to see what this is about. What do they have that like makes them special? So I, I went to Irvine. I trained there for about two months. I trained a little bit with uh, Chiron Gracie. I trained with Octavio Souza. I trained with, I think I even got a roll in with Hodger as a purple belt once, but I was only there for a couple months. And I was like, hey guys, like, can I like work here? Can I like, how can I stay here? Cause I, I mean, you can't work a job and train jujitsu full time. It's just not possible. They refused to hire me despite me like doing well, like I was good. Okay. Like no one, it's not like I went, went in there and they, they mopped the floor with me. I gave black belts fits. Like I would win. Okay. So not every round, obviously, cause that's not how the world works, but like I was substantially effective through right. training primarily by myself and studying collective grappling on the internet. From that point, I had to leave. They were, they didn't care. They had no remorse for that. So I had to leave because they didn't want to hire me to like help around the gym. So I had to go back to Hawaii and I started searching for like, well, what group of people can I train with that will be 
you know, more accepting of my sort of style and that I'm not going to like conform immediately to their mm. tradition. And it was Lloyd Irvin's gym. They were putting out videos online. Uh, they were calling themselves American Jiu Jitsu also at the time. Mm. They called themselves America's Jiu Jitsu team. I don't think they're using the term American Jiu Jitsu. So that, that was in 2010. And that resonated with me. And I, I moved out there and I was only there for two years, but I would say that was probably the most cultivating uh, experience for me from a grappling perspective, not because of the techniques, which I really didn't learn too many techniques from Lloyd himself. I learned from JT Torres. I learned from Jimmy Harbison. There were techniques that, Lo that Lloyd showed me that were actually super effective that I've, I've never seen anywhere else, like certain knee on belly escapes and some arm lock stuff from close guard, um, which I hadn't seen. There was a, a big issue over there with allegations, sexual assault allegations. So I, I, I left. But by that time, I was already competing in many jiu-jitsu tournaments, not just Brazilian ones, but the Abu Dhabi events and uh, international jiu-jitsu events. You that won were not 2012, correct? 20, I, I won 2012. In 2012, I won every tournament I entered. I didn't lose a single time. I'm, I'm talking so, ADCC. That, the Abu Dhabi Pro event, which is the Gi version. Oh. So they had international trials which they, was awesome because it's like, wait, there's an organization that's actually attempting to make an international qualifier where you represent your nation. And it, they had a very unique thing because you would go to your nation's trial and you would get a medal with your flag on it. And I was like, yes, this is what I'm talking about. We need to have a separation yeah. mm -hmm. where the American trial winner goes and fights against the Canadian trial winner fights against the Brazilian trial winner. And it's like, we're all representing our nations and we're gonna have USA on our backs. Or we're gonna have BRZ on our back or whatever you're representing. Just and this like is the, judo, basically. This is the path to like making Jiu Jitsu mainstream was like, make it international, make it an international mm -hmm. competition. Competition drives innovation, it drives progress. Like to, 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 to suppress that is suppressing progress itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah, because, yeah, okay, just to, uh, to say something. Uh, it still feels like, yeah, there is this very heavy Brazilian ener energy on the sphere of jujitsu in a sense, uh, like with all the names and uh, people saying uh, Brazilian jujitsu or Brazilian jujitsu federation of France, for example, or get this, the Japanese Brazilian jujitsu federation. It exists. Yeah, I, like, I think it has to just be like a human inclination to not challenge the authority of something, despite it being absolutely absurd on its face. It's like an emperor wears no clothes situation where it's like people are too uh, apprehensive to challenge sort of their, uh, the authority of those that came before them, even if it's silly. I don't care because I literally don't have Brazilian senseis. And anyone that says that I, like, that I have, they're purely referencing Andre Galvao, yeah. who, Atos. You could, I mean, you could never get him to admit this, but anyone who was in the auto space understood that I was a huge driver of teaching there. I would teach everyone my moves constantly. I could, like with the lapel guard stuff that was completely novel. Everyone wanted to learn it. I was teaching the Mendes brothers, my lapel techniques. I was teaching Galvao, my lapel techniques. And not just lapel techniques. I've also created many Nogi techniques that are lesser known and uh, more subtle. They're not, they were not as, uh, visually different to like strike, mm -hmm. strike up the core, uh, in, in the community. But regardless, any of these guys, if, if confronted in a room with me would be forced to admit that they were not my senseis and they did not mm -hmm. teach. Me. And if there wasn't, if there wasn't any teaching going on, it was an exchange of ideas. It wasn't student, uh, sensei relationship, which is why I got kicked out because I refuse to be, to like subject myself to some guy's authority where he wants to call me his student and claim my creations as his own when I know for a fact that I am teaching him just as much, if not more, than they are teaching me. And it's not teaching if you force someone to listen to you. Like, <laughs> like if you force me to watch you teach and monologue for 10 minutes about some move that I think is invalid or ineffective, like that's not me being your student. That's you having a power control issue. 
And that was part of why I got kicked out. It's like, I'm just not like certain moves you teach. I'm sorry. I'm just not interested. If you want to teach your blue belts that that's fine. I'm a high level grappler. I come up with my own techniques and that's my primary thing. And you're not my sensei. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very, very common in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu culture, which I think is distinctly separate from American jiu-jitsu culture, which is just emerging, although it's a re-emergence of hundred year past catch wrestling jiu-jitsu synthesis. Mm -hmm. the, the American jiu-jitsu culture that's re-emerging and being laid out before us as we see this now is to eliminate that sort of ownership of pupils. Like, oh, because I belted you, I'm therefore responsible for all of your successes. That, that, oh, that's I silly see. on its face. So the, the, the Brazilians look at this and they say, well, you got your belt from this guy. Like, you don't get to choose who you get your belt from. They use it as a, as a mark of their territory. It's like, I claim you. You're now part of my clan. And if I had a choice, I wouldn't get my belt from any Brazilian because that's never been a part of my thing. I just always went to the places where the grappling was most challenging. At the time, I had a lot of inertia in the competitive world, competing in many different events, ADCC Nogi, IBJJF Brazilian, the Abu Dhabi Pro, uh, Gi events, all these things. And... So I was forced to go to Autos out of necessity to find high level training partners. And I went there, not because there was Brazilians there, but because there was Americans there. Michael Liera was there. Mike Carvalito was there. Brian Marisi was there. They actually had a group of American grapplers. And I brought my group of American grapplers from Lloyd's, which was me, mm -hmm. JT, Andres Bernofskis, Mike mm -hmm. Perez, a lot of these guys who are incredibly well known mm -hmm. uh, in the community now. So we, we created an American infusion into Autos. And their primary competitors were in Brazil still. Claudio Calasanz, Hoffa was still in Brazil. Guto Campos was still in Brazil. The only real Brazilian who was there was Galvao. And we were essentially Galvao's train. Like Galvao trained with Americans. He trained with us for his ADCC wins. He trained with me. I was, I was his primary training partner for mm. ADCC 2013-2015. When he was winning. When he was winning. And... Mm. I lost, I got second and third, but he, yeah, he did amazing, but he trained with us. So like, it's just like, it doesn't make sense to, to say that I was somehow learned from Brazilians when my final training partner was Brazilian and he outranked me in their system of belts, which I literally don't care about. I was a purple belt for six years. I was a blue belt for two weeks. Like it's just all over the place. I literally have never cared about any of that because obviously the only, only fundamental uh, metric of skill is who can tap who on the mats, like who's actually better. Because I've been tapping black belts since I was a white belt, so I've always kind of just rejected the belts as some sort of, you know, realistic metric. That's that's all social status. It's a it's a status emblem in the statuses that are, that are created in these sort of grappling hierarchies. So, yeah, it's it's a bit disappointing you say these things like ah oh, he's marking his territory when you see like a black belt moment in some championship you're uh, now like you say like it's oh look no this is my guy i'm giving him his belt and um also this thing with uh you know japanese brazilian jiu-jitsu federation it's you know when i started to 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 dive into the records and seeing things even i did a, a breakdown of hickson's jiu-jitsu and oda's old murky footage there's just so many what we call like little details or invisible jujitsu being done by Oda and and uh, Pedro Valente said something when we spoke and it stuck with me and I've been saying it ever since. He says all these things, uh, Kosen Judo, BJJ, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Kodokan Judo, they're just different expressions of the same art. That's it. Now you want to say I'm I I'm being innovative. Uh, there's some guards added later on. Sure, that that's the nature of competition. But when we're talking about basics and really nailing them and honing them, you know, I'm talking about Kodokan Judo and, of course, the groundwork. Uh, when I say basic, it doesn't mean it's stupid or it's boring. or I mean the stuff that actually works all the way. Um, it's all just, to me, it's Judo. Now, sure, I look at Worm Guard. I look at um, some Tenth Planet stuff. Sure, there's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of additions. What but about the leg locks of today? The leg locks of today? 
I mean, there was a leg lock system in the past. Obviously, was it like this one? Obviously not. Now you can experiment more. Uh, we've had a lot of competitions, so people had to push the envelope, as they say. But uh, what but pushed the envelope? What do you mean? Well, who pushed the envelope? Who changed it? Who brought who brought new life, uh, new tech, new techniques? I like to call it technology, but new techniques. Dean Lister. In, Dean Lister was a huge part of that. An American guy. And Danaher, the, of course. the Danaher team. He's he's so from wait, New Zealand. I believe he's yeah. American. Yeah. Uh, um, he's a citizen also. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. I might. I have a. Yeah, that reminds me. When uh, I think Gordon Ryan was talking with, I believe it was Joe Rogan. He said to him, um, you know, what, us or DDS at the time, it's from zero to a hundred with John while Atos it's like a like a mercenary Jim you know come here you're good come here uh, you you go under yeah. my name now or I don't know of a single white belt who has gone all the way to black belt from Atos who has there's actually only one white belt that I know that has gone all the way to black belt at Atos his name was Abdi maybe now that's changed but at the time I, I did notice that same thing that it's like mm. basically no one starts here and becomes something. Mm. You you aggregate here because there's other talented grapplers here. And I think the Lloyd Irvin infusion actually created mm. that snowball. And you see that happen in a lot of different gyms. It happened with mm. Braza. Mm. It happened with T uh, Tedede and Telus, where yeah. there's sort of like a congregation as like gyms fall apart from social strife or some sort of like interpersonal issues. Mm. And then high level grapplers congregate together in a singular place because it's, that's where they can get good training. But it's a uh, it's sort of like this natural cycle where when you get too many high level grapplers in one place, they're forced to start competing against each other because as you, as you go up in the um, skill ladder, there's fewer and fewer opponents for you to actually mm -hmm. compete against until eventually you're competing against your training partners. And that was, that was one of the things that kind of destroyed autos is a uh, uh, larger, competition competitive group is like I had to compete with Kainan I was competing with Gustavo Batista who th these guys were all transplants as well mm. it's like what are we doing here like why are we even like are, are we on the same team are we competing against each other so there'd be like yeah. a Brazilian group in the corner talking in Portuguese watching me roll with one of their buddies and they would like try and plot how to like defeat me but they wouldn't share the information of how to defeat me but I would share my information with them I'd be like here's what I'm doing good luck <laughs> that's always been my strategy. Um, so I just think it's, it's just, qu it's quite uh, quaint that there's this perception that it's like one unified team when it actually was segregated literally by culture and race, even within the academy. And any American there will tell you that there's a clear separation where it's like, if you don't speak Portuguese, you were not in the club. You know, you were sort of, you were an outsider. It's like, okay, I'll be an outsider. I literally do not care. That's fine with me because I'm only here for one thing, which is live sparring rounds. I want to fight the best guys. That's all I've ever done. That's all I still want to do. Really, is just compete. That explains the patches and the and the gi thing in jujitsu. I never understood that. Now, when you speak like this, I was like, ah, oh, okay. It's it's very like the, I can only think of the word tribal. It's just tribalism, right? You can't you can't. You can take the man out of the tribe, but you can't take the tribalism out of the man. <laughs> With it, when you put enough people in a place, tribalism will form, especially when there's a, a hierarchy of authority. Right. Hierarchy, the hierarchy of authority becomes is, is incredibly pronounced in jiu-jitsu gyms because the head guy, you literally, his word is law because chances are he owns the place. So like he literally controls the environment and that's fine. Like I'm a believer in castle doctrine. If a man wants to control his castle, how he wants to control it and kick people out, I fully support that. I think that's great. Like that is a good thing. And I have my own castle now and I'm just doing the same thing, except I don't kick people out unless they're like, you know, sexually harassing my students or something. We welcome everyone because we don't have a, a, a clicky culture. It's like we we just spar. We don't have these these same mm. traditions that make up Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There's this litany. I don't have you been to many Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gyms and like trained at them? Um, here I've been in here in France and Germany and what's well, why what's the well the re the reason is there's actually a a very consistent set of 
little traditions and secret handshakes you have to do. Although from the moment you enter the academy, like whether it's you must wear the academy's patch or you must uh, only, you can't wear other teams patches in the academy to you must bow before you enter the mats. If you're late, you will be punished. If you tie your belt face in the instructor, that's disrespectful. You must turn away from the instructor to tie your belt. You must ask the instructor before you leave the mat. If you walk off the mat, the instructor will berate you and punish you because you left the mat without his permission. What are some other ones? You have to drill the technique that was taught. If you, if during the drilling portion, if you expand into like a technique that you want to drill, you're berated and chastised and essentially humiliated in front of the entire class for like being a separatist or something. Uh, what else is there? You can't ask upper belts to roll. That's considered disrespectful in certain environments. Um, oh my God. If you're a lower belt, you're not allowed to go for like leg locks on the upper belts. Like if you're, if you're, if your division in the IBJF doesn't allow leg locks, you can't practice leg locks on upper belts. That's considered disrespectful. So that's like a super old remnant of like anti leg lock culture from Brazil. There's literally a hundred stupid things like this. Let me tell you something. I lived and trained in Japan religiously. Okay. So I would, and you know, the Japanese culture when it comes to respect, courtesy, and, and literally none of that. Yeah. Like the whole time your belt thing, it's normal. Uh, in fact, you should, you should always check when maybe like you, you guys fell on the ground and you stood up again, you should check if your belt is good and tight. There's no problem. Even in competition, when the referee does this, you tie your back, no one turns their back or do anything like that. And also, I would spar with with six, seven, eighth degree black belts, which are my teachers. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. And sometimes they would ask me, come on, let's go. Or I would ask them, and it was never uh, a problem. It was, sure, there's no, I mean, you don't... Um, for example, the, the questions of hygiene and stuff, of course, these, these are, uh, these are non-debatable, but everything else is just, it was all us and we're talking, we're laughing, we're training, we, it, it's now it, it this is like great school type of uh, parenting. Can I go to the bathroom? It's, it's absolutely just patronizing and absurd. Like to, to think that I'm a paying client at this a bit this business in America, yet somehow it's like I have to work for them is crazy and backwards. And it comes from Brazil. That's just part of their the Brazilian culture. And that's fine. Like I have no problem with Brazilian culture. I think Brazilians are a super fun people to hang but out I with. They were anti-authority. That's like that that's like their thing. I mean, oh, they didn't like the judo stuff, the bowing, and that that's why there's no much not much integration with Kodokan, and that's why authority that isn't them. That's why they don't like me to have authority. <laughs> they don't want anyone to have authority except them. It's it's very strange, uh, and it doesn't make sense. But yes, the the whole like, how can you say that what I'm doing is Brazilian jiu-jitsu when I'm teaching a broad and eclectic set of techniques not found in Brazilian jiu-jitsu? But we also teach techniques that are found in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's a section of what we do. Sure, they have contributed to the art the martial arts and like obviously that is true however it's not entirely what we do and it's not even 25 percent. it's like 25 percent of what we do mm. but the fact that we eliminated all of the traditions and culture that comes with that like techniques aside all of the other stuff that happens on the mat how people interact how you're supposed to address the sensei the, the brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors will make you call them professor They'll say, no, don't call me Andre. Don't call me Mr. Gavao. Call me professor. Call me this. You have to call me this. Professor, professor, professor. It's like, okay, professor. I'll call this is your gym. I'll call you professor. We don't do that. You can call us, you can call our coaches, whatever you want. Call them coach, call them Andres, call them Keenan. I literally don't care. So that's just another example of the thing like the things we got rid of. If you're late, that's fine. You pay me, you pay the gym. This is your gym. This is a gym you can train at. You can come as you please. Like it's not disrespectful. If you need to use the bathroom, you don't have to check with this, the teacher and ask permission. You're an you're an adult in control of your own life. 
go use the bathroom by all means. I literally don't care. Another thing is if the, if the teacher is showing a technique that you find not relevant to yourself, practice another technique. No one's going to chastise you for wanting to train what you want to train during the limited amount of time you have on the mats. There's so just as techniques, some things work for you, some don't. Like that's why we, there's a thing called tokuiwaza, which literally means the technique you're good at. So things you specialize in, that's fine. Absolutely, but that's not allowed in many Brazilian jiu-jitsu gyms, and it's not like there's some sort of like book that clearly defines what the Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, secret handshakes are and the things you must do to like maintain good status in the eyes of the professor. It's totally arbitrary and it's held together just by like a very thin thread of what their previous sensei made them do. And so it changes from gym to gym. It's not consistent. One gym, you'll be punished for one thing. Another gym, you'll be punished for a totally different thing. And it's just absolutely absurd and totally bad for introducing Americans to jujitsu. So it's actually, it actually drives Americans away from learning jujitsu. And so pe people, jujitsu has bl blown up in America despite Brazilian jujitsu gyms, despite them, because jujitsu itself and grappling is so fun that even all of the weird tribalism and authoritarian top-down control of like some egomaniacal gym owner, yeah. people will still train there. And that's great and, and fine. But there's actually a better way to do it, which is just to have it more open and just like not have it, all of that dogma bearing down on you every second you're in an academy. Um, and you can just relax and do jiu-jitsu and that's what we do. And I know for a fact that Autos, I was there pretty early in Autos's uh, lifespan. I mean, not that early. I think they were open like six years before I got there. And I think towards uh, before they moved locations, they had about 300 students. So it took them like six years to get 300 students. Mm. And then I, I know they, they hit around like 600, or did I say 300? Yeah, 300 students. And then it took them another probably four or five years to hit 600 students. Whereas my American Jiu Jitsu style is so much more accommodated to the person who walks in off the street who knows nothing about Jiu Jitsu other than hearing Joe Rogan or Jocko talk about how good it is for your like psyche and like be, being a man. Uh, we hit 600 students in four years. So I, it's like literally it's a better on-ramp and uh, of exposure to grappling, to martial arts, to all the positive benefits of being in a community of people, you know, participating in a collective uh, action, sport, identity, and getting all those benefits from it. And just all you have to do is just cut away all of the garbage that doesn't add value. So that's what I've done. And that that's like the true foundation of what I am now relaying the framework for, which is American Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And so it's insulting to me to call, to try and say that what I do is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because I have 100% experienced Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I reject it. That is not who I am. That is not my identity. And that is not where I come from. And then to have, to be attacked online and have people say that, no, I am Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. What all, everything I've done is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And not only that, but, <laughs> I should be grateful for all of these things. <laughs> it's totally silly and like indefensible in a face-to-face -face conversation. It's it's uh, like I'm I'm not in the sphere of jujitsu, let's call it. Uh, even like they tell me, you know this champion and all this guy. I'm like I know a few names, obviously, but now you're saying all these things. And first of all, it was a big shock to me when. I went into judo and I started to study a bit and see things because I'm just very curious by nature. And to see these things that are being repeated year after year after year. And now, finally, it's it's a bit better. Uh, but these things, for example, I've heard it for years now that uh, the first things uh, in Brazilian that was gone was like the, the authoritative style. We, uh, Robert Drysdale, he was talking to me that... Um, in in one judo school in Japan, uh, students arrived early. They were sweeping the mats, uh, and then I think in the same day or in the same week, he went to a jujitsu gym in Japan. People were arriving late, um, or that was fine. They were talking about having acai. So it's like he was showing that it's a different culture, basically. And I I thought that the whole rejection of authority and everyone is just relaxed was 
was a Brazilian thing. Now I'm, I get to find out that there is this uh, controlling aspect to it, and not in a hierarchical way in any means, but it's just to to uh, that's uh, how do I say this? It's like a compensatory type behavior for maybe insecurities. Maybe, I don't know where it is. Like it's it's something in the psychology of the, the maybe teacher there. Every culture is going to have their own authority structure, right? And they will reject other authority structures from other mm. cultures. Mm. That's just the nature of it. It's not like you're not going to have it. You don't have like synthesis of cultures for some reason. The cultures mm. stay like as isolated pillars for some reason, for the most part. Like even in, in Japan, there's a huge Brazilian population and a lot and a lot of Japanese Brazilian uh, mixed people. Well, I'm, I have to say, they're just like the most beautiful people you'll ever see. It's like such an exotic mix of, of human, Brazilian, Japanese. Um, but even despite their, their mixed race and culture, they congregate to the Brazilian culture. And so they all speak Portuguese. They don't even speak Japanese. They all live in the same place. It's basically a mini Brazil in Japan. And you see the same thing in America. Like I, I live in uh, an area of San Diego that's predominantly, well, not predominantly, but I'd say it's about like half Vietnamese. Uh, and so there's a lot of Vietnamese around here and they, they kind of do their thing. They do, they, they live their Vietnamese culture. They open up their restaurants, they attend each other's businesses, they speak each other's language. Like all Chinatown. That. Chinatown. Like it's just natural for people to, to aggregate to those of likeness right it's their kin they're just going to aggregate to kin and i don't think there's there's nothing wrong with that but when you have a certain group of people try and say that you must be a part of their cultural identity and try and like incorporate you into it and like you like sort of demand of you to continue to represent their culture that's a set that's like i mean i, I i'm not really a liberal but like that is a, a innate, like sort of colonialism in, in a way right it's like that's that's but the, i i also believe that the right of conquest is a real thing like if if a, a people can come into an area and control it that's the, it's theirs it's not illegal it's like they dominated it in some way whether demographically economically or by force a people can come into another nation and claim aspects or territory or ideas and like they can do that but that's literally human history it's human it's all of human history and it's 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 literally accepted and that's how all nations have come to be at some point but the other thing that is has always been a part of human history is to be able to resist that so every culture that is subjected to another culture's oppression which i don't think it's really to be oppressed because you can resist for it for it's resistance to a force and so i'm resisting Obviously, this culture, which I don't think is like organized in a way that's like trying to like, you know, take my any of my sovereignty or anything. But I'm just saying, I don't want to be a part of your thing. Leave me alone. <laughs> Leave me alone. I don't want to be a part of your thing. Do your thing. And I'm going to do my thing. So, but, mm, yeah, go ahead. So what you're saying is you you reject their cultural aspects, technical uh, heritage, not necessarily all of it, because you yourself came up with stuff. There's also the huge Japanese heritage in all of this. Not, let's not forget this. Um, there is um, also the little aspects in the the academy, etc. So, in your so what? In short, what Keenan Cornelius is saying, I'm American. The my cultural aspects of my gyms are American. Uh, my technical heritage is very wide between Japanese, American, and Brazilian. It's multicultural. It's like so it's you've assimilated it into this what you call your own expression of jujitsu, just like Mongolians, just like Georgians with judo and their own wrestling culture, and hence why it is not fundamentally Brazilian jujitsu. And I'm not saying it's not jujitsu. We do jujitsu, but it's not Brazilian jujitsu. Mm. Who's right? who founded the IBJJF? I I'm not sure. I believe it was uh, Car Carlos Gracie Jr. Mm. And the, one of the and most, the, like, yeah. probably the most successful jujitsu business of all time, I might add, because they also own Gracie Baja. Yeah, that, that's right. what Dr uh, Drysdale said. It was a uh, like a big murky mess. 
until IVJJF, which structured everything and also which allowed, of course, the all the competitions to to flourish and of course develop because that what develops things it's just competitions yeah but there was also american grappling events which was my first exposure to grappling because in the early 2000s ibjf competitions were not super common so like as a as a uh, purple belt and blue belt it was very difficult to even get to ibjf competitions they only had them in la they weren't international at the time aside from brazil which is a separate federation called CBJJ or some yeah. CBBJJ, some other federation. That's judo, like the CB, yeah, they wear it on their uh, thing when they compete world okay. on the world stage. Yeah, so I, it's, it's separate, but Grappler's Quest and Naga were the American competitions and those were big. Yeah. And those that's actually primarily what I competed in coming up. I competed mostly in Nagas and in Grappler's Quests because they were in all the states and uh, they had high-level UFC fighters. They had Ryan Hall that BJ Penn was competing in them. Um, all of the American grapplers, Mark Lehman, um, there, there's many of them, Jeff Glover, Bill Cooper, so many Americans that are kind of just forgotten about in jiu-jitsu culture, even though they're, they've are they been competing for 20 years, like since the early 2000s and, and earlier, there were Americans grappling in non-Brazilian events. So like grapplers quest and beating brazilians i might add like brazilians would compete in some of these events and they were primarily nogi and that's a that's probably the biggest key distinction is what style of grappling was rejected by the brazilians it was nogi they don't they did not like nogi for the most part it was primarily gi because nogi was associated with the leg locks which of course no gi is what is nogi it's submission wrestling how convenient that it, it, it's they, it's portrayed as like this lack of something. It's without the gi. Like what a brutal, archaic idea without the gi. It's almost like it's viewed as it's uh, uncouth in some way. Um, but the reality is no gi grappling is the westernized thread of grappling because that is what stems from the Roman Empire. Who, who started the no gi uh, competitions? Or when? Well, it depends on what you consider nogi. I consider well, the. Well, we say you know jujitsu, but nogi. I'm not talking I, about I, hatch or luta livre or. I'm talking okay, about well, jujitsu. Like just submissions. I mean, it's difficult to say because like the catch wrestling events, it's basically submissions, but they have a an alternative way of scoring. Instead of saying this position is worth four points, and if you get four points at the end of the match, you win. They just said if you put your opponent's shoulders on the mat, two out of three times you win. That's effectively a point. It's not like, I don't think you should d differentiate that from like a pin is different than a point. They're the same yeah. thing. It's they awarded a point that helps you win for getting a certain position, which is right. basically side, side control mount. These are pins. And I think John right. Danner has done an excellent job of explaining that, that the pin is not necessarily like something that separates jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu from wrestling. The pin is still there. It's just, they don't acknowledge it. To, mm -hmm. to pin your opponent means to control them. It's actually a fundamental aspect of winning a grappling match is to pin I someone. I compete in judo. I know exactly what you mean. So they, so the, the Brazilians got rid of the idea of the pin because they didn't have a wrestling heritage. So they, they kind of were just like, we don't care about pins. We don't have a wrestling heritage. Their oh, national the, and the throw. Their martial art was capoeira. That was their martial art, which came from Africa. Like it was from their, the African uh, community in Brazil who brought like dance and music and incorporated this martial art. And there was a synthesis there. And I, I tr I've trained in Capoeira. I'm actually a green Cordao in Capoeira as well. I, okay. I, like, know. I know a lot about martial arts. I've trained all the martial arts. Hand, stick, knife, and gun. I'm, I'm, I believe that martial arts should be trained, like all martial arts should be trained, mm -hmm. not a singular type. Uh, so the pin, I believe, is a fundamental aspect of no gi, because no gi is simply jujitsu with no gi. <laughs> it's it's submissions without the gi on. Right, that that's what is has happened. And I've been a big proponent that gi is more complicated than no gi because there's more complexity in the gripping and things like that. But but I I don't know who the first no gi competition was. I think it's ABCC. I would guess. If you're not counting catch wrestling and wrestling.
at some issue. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not counting catch. I know what catch is, and they operate at a different system. Let me say this: you took out, you took off the gi. Historically speaking, if you look at the Tenjin Shinryu book and the Tetsushin also book, there is depictions in the same book. Guys wearing the the kimono and the hakama grappling during either the self defense section and the randori section. We can see the guard. You can see the side control, the mount. Um, what what year would you see those depictions? Um, I believe like 1880s, and uh, which is one of the Jigoro Kano schools. And then in the same book, you see them, and I, I already covered this. You see them. Uh, with that only with the with their shorts, so the sarumata or the monkey pants, and that's basically their underwear. And he's doing and he's putting his partner in a rear naked choke. So at this time, let's not forget the kimono is much thinner than the gi, so it it can rip easily. And so they, I I believe they grappled in both, you know, closed and naked, which is like all the cultures around the world. But my thing is. When you do no gi, you still have the guard system. You still have you know, like attacking off your back. I don't know in wrestling how it is or catch, but is there the idea of the guard in catch or um, some type of wrestling? I, I haven't seen uh, the, the idea of the guard in catch wrestling, but it actually, right. can, you see, can you see my screen? No. I tried to share my I screen. I can see the, the logo. Turn on and off your camera again. Maybe that will work. But uh, my the thing is, so one, if you are clothed or naked, but you're still applying judo principles, you're still doing judo. At least in my book. Now I can see the screen. You, you understand see. my my point of view? Yeah. Sure, you can incorporate a lot of catch because now you're without the without the jacket, and you can apply a lot of things, especially if. Things like spine locks are uh, permi uh, permissible. And uh, can, uh, okay, well, can you yeah, see this I, window? I, yeah, I saw I saw this yesterday. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is the only this is in the Len Lanius's American Jiu Jitsu book. Hmm. This is the earliest depiction of a guard I have found in uh, the American thread of like catch hmm. wrestling. What year I've, is this? I, I believe he published this in the 20s. Let's see. Hmm. Doesn't have the date on here. Hmm. 1922. Right. So the idea of the guard did exist, although it was from Japanese jiu-jitsu. Like, obviously, they're referencing jiu-jitsu from, from the perspective of, like, they believed jiu-jitsu was, like, self-defense. It was, like, used for fighting to the death. You know, that was kind of the idea. And there's not a lot. This is the only image that depicts a guard and a sweep. He doesn't even come up on top, but there's only two images. It's a pretty short book. Uh, but this is this is substantial because 1922, the like the idea that the like you you mentioned in your video that Grace that Gracie invented the guard or something is just blatantly false. That's false. Of course. Yeah. And in fact, 1906, you see a proper open guard. Yeah. So here is American Jiu Jitsu, 1922. An American performing a very, probably very ineffective, but nonetheless a clear depiction of a guy playing a guard and attempting a sweep with his legs, which is like fundamentally guard. Isn't this like the you kick the knee, which straightens it, and then you block the ankle like a push pull, basically? Yeah, he's he's like I'm not I'm not arguing for how effective this technique is. I'm just saying that clearly yeah. you can see that the idea of the guard did exist. It also was called American Jiu Jitsu. Like, mm. so I'm, I'm just using you mean this. a guy attacking off his back. That's what you're trying to tell me. Yeah, to, to, yeah, to yeah, yeah. you. Okay. And no, no, there, even... there is no doubt. Like I said, uh, if you see Yamashita and and all these guys, they fought off their backs. They they pinned in the 1886 uh, competition between the other Jiu Jitsu schools and Kano's Kodokan school. There is no doubt that I would say even the president, Roosevelt, uh, knew a lot of groundwork. Absolutely. But I mean, this is one of the big criticisms I get. Like, it, as you go deeper into an argument with someone who's saying, like, the guard, it's all Brazilian, et cetera, 
there's clear counter evidence and and like obviously the japanese had the guard first but this is pretty unique because the americans they did not want to be on their back for like cultural reasons like they thought mm -hmm. that it was like not masculine to be on mm -hmm. on bottom and that was like a big part of the rejection of like really accepting jujitsu uh if you look through the the newspaper archives here let me uh i'll show you this one this is from the 1950s but you can kind of see how it transitioned from what was considered a martial art to something for women so tell me if you can see this as i switch the screen yeah I can see. a defense program for pretty girls it's the ancient oriental art of jiu-jitsu, which thousands of Americans used to practice for fun in the days before the Blitzkrieg and parachute troops. So this is after World, World War uh, two. One or Two. So both this happened, this is after. There's clearly an understanding of that the Americans practiced this in mass to some mm -hmm. degree prior, prior to the wars. And it fell out of style. And the reason it fell out of style is because of Pearl Harbor. There was a huge cultural right. rejection of the Japanese and their culture mm. during that time. And jujitsu was one of the casualties in America. And it was then projected to be for women. It was like, that's only good for women. Men do boxing and wrestling. And it's like, mm. sure, we'll do a, a joint, a, a, a hold, but like, we don't need holds. We'll just punch you in the face and slam you on your head. Right. And th this this continues uh, from the 50s to the 60s. It's like four women, four women this, four women that. I have a, a ton of clippings here I can show you about can, how. There, are there techniques I'd love to see because I only see the the guy aggressing the woman, but I can't see what she's doing. Yeah, this is this is a screenshot I took. I don't have the full article of this particular right. thing, but you can find it if you just search. You know, any of these any of this text, put it into Google newspaper search, and it'll pull this stuff up. There, there is uh, a, I, I believe, a Showa period. So, like, I, I believe 1910s. I, I always mix up my eras in Japanese, like the Showa and the Taisho. Uh, it's a self-defense book for women, and it talks about when a guy aggresses you, you put him between your feet. There is the, like, either you sweep or um, you do like a scissor strangle. So you you uh, you strangle the the, the waist, like a uh, little like under the ribs which is incredibly painful if you scissor your legs and if a guy is aggressing you so attacking off your back is uh is quite old even like for women's self-defense yeah and all, all i'm saying is like people ask or i'm in, not in saying the... no of course like even if you look at the detroit press of my august 1905 they're oh, saying the, the naval uh, the u.s na uh, naval uh, academy they were doing jujitsu with uh Jap under the Japanese. Here's the uh, the full picture. I found it here. Oh, okay. So it's tomoenage or the sacrificing uh, throw. Yeah, we have like some sumo yeah. sumi gaishi style tomoenage. This yeah. is this is from yeah. the, the fifth, like 1954, I think. Right. Right. I also have some some clippings of like advertisements for jujitsu schools in New York, mm. um, all sorts of just it's just interesting stuff. Like mainly that there is a threat of jujitsu in America. They even called it American jujitsu. The guard existed. It was became sort of awash with wrestling and catch wrestling. There was some racism that kind of drove it out of the public eye. Yeah, that's actually uh, a great point. It's, it's it's very important because you know that that rejection of that Japanese. Uh, notion because of of course pearl harbor and being a war enemy and uh so maybe the idea of uh of it all was just not fully socially acceptable while it can be in, in brazil it's fine but yeah i can see why you know we never heard on the other side of the continent more or about more challenges or depictions of fights so if you have fights from the like first part of the 20th century of guys going to the ground and staying there, that would be amazing. So here, here's one of the earliest uh, clippings I could find of someone being anti-jujitsu. This is right. relatively early. I think this was 1906 or 1907, where they essentially speak negatively about jujitsu, that it's too mm -hmm. complicated, that it requires a bunch of intimate an anatomic knowledge they use tricky moves they, they use a lot of rhetoric that's like they're trick it's trickery it's like somehow unhonorable 
um, to put someone in these sort of chokes or if they relax their uh, their guard and you slip behind them while they're not paying attention and things like this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> while stunned that you then seize them and bind them and handcuff them and then dispatch them with the sword. So there was like anti-jujitsu stuff pretty early on. And this was overcome because of Roosevelt, because this, this anti-jujitsu stuff was basically just crushed by Roosevelt being fully on board and actually um, creating the, the circumstances for Yamashita to go teach at the Annapolis Naval Academy for two years. Right. So. Uh, let me ask you something. Uh, like they said, the proof is in the pudding. In BJJ or like those uh, Brazilian terminologies for techniques, Americana. Yeah. Who? Uh, so I'm guessing someone told me the story. I was. I remember I, I was new doing YouTube videos and I say, I'm saying, why is it called Americana and the other one is Kimura? It's literally the same submission, but reversed. And it's Ude Garami. And I was, I was coming in hot at the time and uh, someone explained, you know, he learned it from an American and that's why they call it Americana. And uh, so th there's literally some American grappling seeping into it. So, but if you right. know a little bit about who taught it, that would be also good because I don't know much about the the, the nuances of the story. Um, I don't think this is, that's not the right one. I'm trying to show you a tab of Frank Gotch applying the hammerlock in one of his events that he did. And the hammerlock, I believe, is what they're talking about when they say the Americana. Mm. So the Americans called it the hammerlock. And it's essentially, it's the Americana as, you know, in jiu-jitsu, they, you, you know, it mostly as the Americana, but it's, it's all, it's actually referenced as a hammerlock in um, Japanese MMA events. So the Japanese announcers will say hammerlock okay. <laughs> to, to describe it. They don't say Americana. Uh, my, my screen sharing isn't, isn't super effective here. Because I have so many tabs open. In Japanese, it's it means tangled hands or tangled arms. Okay. Tangled arms. Yeah, I think I'll just have to send you these because I, I have like a hundred tabs open. When I go to Skype to select the proper sure. one, I can't select. I can't find yeah. the one I actually want to show you. But I have files I can open much easier. Mm -hmm. I could download them and put them all in a file. Um, but yeah, Frank Frank Gotch also invented the toehold, from what I can tell. When was that? I'm not sure when he invented it, but it, if you if you read his um, the narrations of his matches, they frequently reference that the toehold is sort of his signature move that he would apply. Oh, he said he invented it, or the the announce no he didn't I, I haven't seen anything that s says anything was invented mm -hmm. you don't really see a lot of people claiming techniques at the time I don't think that right. was like in the, the the mental awareness to like claim a technique yeah. but he frequently used the toehold and they reference it as the toehold and the toehold interestingly is one of the only submissions that has that survived through all of pro wrestling to modern day. Oh. So you, you see even in the from the 90s to the 2000s, the toehold being applied in pro wrestling before even like all pro wrestling has always used the toehold as like one of their only valid submissions, which I think is interesting. God. Kurt Angle. Okay. Yeah, Kurt Angle was well known for it. But Frank Gotch was, mm -hmm. I think it's Frank. Uh, he was known for his toehold, the footlock. Mm -hmm. and, they, and there's a little bit of like, a misnomer there because when they say leg attack the, when the americans write about leg attack sometimes they mean grabbing the leg from standing and like mm. lifting it to take them down or like do a trip but the toe hold specifically i think is clearly mm. a, a solution because like there's not a takedown where you can grab their toes <laughs> mm. yeah um, what um it, there's a there's a bunch of variations to it there's where you can entangle like this uh, you can see mifune like the the god of judo one guy tried to lace his leg, so he grabbed the, the heel and the toes and did this. There's right. uh, in Kawaishi's book, you can find it uh, like this, but he's he's not rotating, he's pressing down. So it's, it's like a straight ankle lock effect, and it's called um, Ashidori Garami, meaning uh, like a put, uh, 
like a foot foot grabbing entanglement, something like that. Yeah, I, I there's I, uh, a bunch of them. I was going to show you that there's also a, just an interesting thread if you just search Roosevelt Jiu-Jitsu on any of the old newspaper archives, you can find all of these references to like Roosevelt continuously challenging grapplers after his presidency. Like for 15 years afterwards, he would when he would be on like dipl uh, diplomatic mm -hmm. diplomatic missions or different things, he would come across people who claimed to grapple, and there's essentially him recounting the story about how he would put like various international diplomats in his guillotine. <laughs> so he would like challenge people it, like in full clothes and be like, well, let's let's just wrestle for it. And they would try and do their sort of culturally relevant grappling and he would like jujitsu them. Right. Uh, but there's yeah, a funny yeah. art yeah. Yeah. where he so, he claimed to put a guy in a, in a, they call it in yeah. chancery, which I'm not totally sure, but I think they, that means a front headlock types position. Yeah. So, so yeah. essentially saying um, there is a jujitsu heritage in the northern part of the continent. Yeah, it's just it, it was it was never well known except for that time period. So from dur during the build up to the Gilded Age of the Roaring Twenties, mm -hmm. there was a lot of this showmanship and championship yeah. fights, and it was a big part of the culture. And the the thing that really set it off track was high technology. So when we had physicists invent like coming up with like Einstein with the, all of the field equations and the physicists coming up with you know nuclear technology and advanced photonics and all lasers and everything, this just changed how war was thought about and the idea that you needed humans to fight other humans hand to hand just became totally obsolete and irrelevant and clear that everyone bit switched focus or lost interest in these more primal methods of warfare um, yeah and you don't you don't really see the same thing in brazil brazil doesn't have that same sort of technological warring history that the u.s has developed over the last hundred years uh which is clearly about you know high firepower <laughs> even world war one if you if you look at it it's crazy they started with uh wool hats and um uh, weapons from the 1880s and you know, single shot bolt action rifle they finished with the war airplanes and uh machine guns that are absolutely insane and like the mauser tank for the like anti -tank, chemical warfare uh, mustard know, gas the whole thing. It's all, in, all in four years short, incredibly short amount of time and if you look at the sort the, the uh nature of the 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 I guess there were specialists, like wartime specialists, kind of predicting how the next wars would go. They predicted trench warfare. And obviously, trench they knew that trench warfare was not going to be pretty. It's like you're literally fighting in trenches in the ground. So it's literally close combat. And bayonets don't, like, they don't really work that well. Like, long rifles with long, yeah. it's too tight in there. It's not super effective. So jujitsu was literally seen as a war technology internationally germany also I, I can pull up the germany uh clip here just to show you that this is true yeah there, there is a guy from the 20s i forgot his name it's um even it's i think it's referenced in mein Kampf or something about jujitsu it's crazy. interesting yeah there's a clip about how the german kaiser is now is also bringing jujitsu to germany but I mean, the Germans, they, they were the catalysts of the technological innovation of the time with the first jet airplane. They, they had a hydrogen peroxide um, aluminum fin catalyst jet airplane, mm. the very first jet the, airplane. The Zeppelin you're talking about. Those. No, no, no. This was a literal rocket jet. So they used hydrogen peroxide over a silver fin, like a silver grid catalyst. And if you pass hydrogen peroxide over a silver catalyst, it releases a huge amount of oxygen and steam under super high pressure, and they created the first. Um, you could call it a rocket, um, but it was a it was a plane. It was a rocket plane that could go 600 miles an hour, and they actually it was used in in uh, for like reconnaissance. Most of them crashed, but the, the, when they saw when the Americans saw what the Germans were doing with technology, they totally changed their focus and started uh, uh, the engineering warfare was created 
an uh, sort of a different thread, but the the reason that a lot of war historians attribute the the Allies' victory was because of higher quality fuel. The U.S. had access to higher higher octane fuel, while the Germans had access to better engineers. And the octane of the fuel uh, dictated the results of so many um, air battles because you could go you could go into a steeper climb without stalling if you have higher octane fuel. And so, from a, a mobility standpoint in dogfights, that was a huge advantage, and you could actually you know perform aerial maneuvers to help you get behind. The adversaries. So, yeah, it's all very interesting. The, the concepts of war, I think jujitsu and grappling kind of represent this base uh, abstraction of warfare. Captain and Alan jiu- Smith. Who's that? I mentioned him in the video. He's a he's a World War One veteran and one of the first uh, Westerners to have a Kodokan black belt. And surely he was teaching that during the war or prior to the war. Yeah, very interesting. Here's the uh, let me open American. This. He has a book in the 1920s. Here it is. Can you see this? Yeah, Kaiser Order Jiu Jitsu. Whoa, Japanese wrestling to be practiced in army and navy gymnasia. Berlin, February 12th. Kaiser. So prior to to 18, 1918. Yeah. It's no secret Europe was really big on it. If you look at all those uh, figures, Uenishi and uh, um, Taro Miyake, all these guys. Yeah, so the history paints a different story that is clearly not uh, Brazilian hegemon. It's not like Brazilian only. Mm, uh, I see what it, you mean. And that, that, that hype came about from the UFC, probably the most successful marketing event of all time, right? Like they created the environment and the circumstance where they were able to truly show that grappling and jujitsu was very effective in single unarmed combat, which is was known. This is a this is a rediscovery. It's from 100 years ago. It's a rediscovery that hand to hand combat is dominated by jujitsu, not by like the Gracies were the ones who performed it. But as we know, it was the Japanese who have created this over thousands of years and the the contributions that the Gracies made from a technical standpoint are minimal, but the contributions that the Gracies made from a cultural awareness standpoint were substantial. However, that does not mean that I have to represent them. Right. I see, I see what you mean. Like, for example, we could have had UK judo or UK jiu-jitsu because also it was very big in the Budokai or in France with Awazu and uh, Kawaishi, but we, we just call them judo and still now obviously we, we don't behave like the Japanese because we're not Japanese, but still uh, to say that this is a Brazilian and only or with a particular uh, a new martial art as people say is I, I've disagreed with this since, since day one and it's, again it's all exp- different expressions of the same art. Okay, tell me if you can hear this video. Do you see this video? Let me know if you can hear this. Uzo actually had asked yes. to my order to fight the wrestler. He may have beat the wrestler and may have remained in America. And maybe we will be learning American Jiu Jitsu instead of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now. You know, but sometimes history is changed by little events like that. Uh, Kondi was so. So there you go. They, they even acknowledge American Jiu Jitsu as, as an aspect, be it. Yeah. Middle known, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's it's all due to 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 really aggressive marketing at the end of the day, which so many things are like. There's so many old marketing campaigns that were just so effective that people if they become almost like uh, old wives' tales, right? Mm-hmm. But they're actually just marketing for like how to like, basically there would be some problem some marketing firm or some sort of pharmaceutical company would say this is how you solve that problem like uh tylenol to reduce fever fevers are a good thing like fever is an important immune response it doesn't damn it's not like having a high fever gives you brain damage that's all a myth that was all created by tylenol the tylenol company created this false 
illusion that you needed to give children Tylenol when they had a fever. How convenient for Tylenol, right? But then it became this sort of uh, un supposedly understood just thing you do. You give children Tylenol. Up to till now, so many women in America give their kids Tylenol when they have a fever. There's zero reason to do that, except for an old marketing campaign by Tylenol. But it, it's, it, it does reduce fever, but it does that, that's purely addressing a symptom, not the cause. And that's a re recurring thing you see in marketing is uh, effective ways to address a symptom, but not the cause, because it's counterproductive for medicine to address the cause from a financial standpoint, right? So it's many, like many Kellogg's. things. Kellogg's? Yeah, with the like breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Right, How convenient. Right. Yeah, eat eat ground up corn that we just happen to have a lot of. Yeah. <laughs> and buy it every day. So yeah, it's like there's always going to be misunderstandings historically, but it's it's very easy to argue the points from a place of truth. Like if I'm pursuing this in a truthful manner, I'm not trying to be disingenuous, but the reality is this exists. There's clear historical evidence of it. You can follow the historical thread. It makes sense. Mm. Um, and I, it just happens to be something, it, it, it is controversial. It is a little bit inflammatory, but I think it's for the right reasons. And my, my genuine goal is to expose more people to jujitsu, mm -hmm. not to uh, attack any particular subculture of jujitsu. I, I just think that, that the, the reignition of American jujitsu and it's a blank slate, really. Like we we can make it be whatever we want, but the good news is the Americans can decide what it is, and that's really how I run my gym. is It's essentially up to a vote in most situations. I survey the students, I ask them what they want more of, what they want less of, who they want to see more of, who they want to see less of, what they want to, how the class structure needs to be, what amenities are we missing. Yeah. Like I just approach it in a totally different way, which I think comes from hmm. the the American capitalist notion of like providing value for others begets value from others. So that's kind of the, the approach we take. Uh, and you don't really see that in Brazilian jiu-jitsu cultures and gyms. Yeah, I, mean, I, see, I see what you mean. I mean, I remember just showing things like the De La Riva in the 1920s or a triangle choke from the 1920s and saying, look, it's been done before. It's, it's just all part of judo. Now, granted the, the competition rules, formulated a new expression and people were just insane in my comments and just ridiculous claims like elio learned catch from tattoo which is false and he learned judo and then he combined them the two and now you have brazilian jiu-jitsu or or in the past uh, you only throw but then the guy is extended you, you either go down and pin him or if the arm is extended you just do uh like a, like a transition only Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they created that system, all of it on the ground to tie everything. It's just the most ridiculous things being said in my comments and all the name calling and the disrespect. At, at some point, I would just want it to stop, but luckily I didn't. But now I see a different perspective of it all. Like, okay, it developed also in France, in the UK. There's a lot of history with these uh, clubs and masters also now in the US too. So why only sticking to the, the Brazilian notion that if we learn the ground, oh, it's, it's, it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yes, it's Judo, but the Brazilians, they, they took it and they really, you know, make it shine or whatever it is. But apparently, obviously, you know, many countries were good at it prior or prior to the UFC or whatever it is. Yeah, and every good empire has to come to an end at some point when they overreach or lose control of their subjects. And that's kind of what this is. It's like, it's not an empire per se, but this is, it, it's analogous, analogous to one um, by labeling it as such, by labeling it Brazilian. And, but the, the, like you said, they did make their contributions, but America and the Americans are making more substantial com contributions now. And so it, it's worthy of a fork, a fork that is somewhat derivative from what the Brazilians were doing. But as we saw, the Brazilians were not really innovating technical creations as much as facilitating tournaments and mm. events, and which access. I think is access, which I, I think is super valuable. Uh, but we also have American events coming up as well. And like, if you're an American and you don't want to represent your nation, what are you doing? 
Like go, like, are you representing Brazil? Or are you like, what are you, what are you, do you want to be Brazilian? <laughs> like, what is it actually? Like, why, why are you tied to it? And what I have found is that the Americans don't actually want that. They just didn't know that there was an alternative. So just by providing some, like America and the legal system, everything is about history and tradition. Like if it's not historical and traditional, it's not really a valid thread of society. And you really need that historical, traditional thread to follow. Otherwise, society gets really weird really quickly, right? Like mm -hmm. you kind of need that congruency from decade to decade, century to century, so that we don't have these offshoots of societies that fail, which you see in all sorts of different ideologies and events. So that reminds yeah, me. That yeah. reminds me of the meme of uh, Mackenzie Dern's uh, the evolution of her accent, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a funny one that, of her uh, voice changing. I mean, that that's a natural thing people do when they're around different. If you if you're multi if you're bilingual or multilingual, right. you're gonna you, react. Yeah in certain things it's 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 one of those it's like kind of silly but it's also like i mean anyone would do that if they have right they're multilingual but yeah i gotta get going it was great having sure. this conversation with you can you send me this recording i'd love to post it just to like share my thoughts too